All right, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for being back with us. And if you will stand and turn with me in your Red Church Hymnal to page 137. Page 137 in the Red Church Hymnal. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. He'll let us know just in a second. But here's what I'd like us to do tonight. I want us to just give us some good soft music. Let's all come around this altar and pray. And before we even come, I want to mention that Brother Billy Mitchell has been put on hospice. So we want to pray for him that God would just meet the needs of the family. We also want to ask you to pray for Brother Wiley Brackett's wife, Dolores. She was placed on hospice today. And uh, sometimes people live for years on hospice, but we're praying that God would help Dolores tonight. And then our missionary, Brother Jeremiah Cooley, did well. He's very sore, has a lot of pain from the surgery, but he's recovering well. And we're so grateful of that. And uh, uh, Melissa and Ron uh, Smith just texted us, and they had a death in their family on Sunday. And then they were coming to church tonight. Got another call of a family member that's in the emergency room. So they're heading to the hospital. Should be there by now. Tell them we'd be praying for the family member. And then Shannon Langley, who really needs her prayers. I think yesterday she ate three bites of some soup. And so she's weak. And we want to pray that God would touch her. I look back and see Brother uh, Daryl. If you've not seen him, he's there. And uh, the greatest thing, he's standing so close to Brother Dez. He's older than Dez. But he's so happy, his hair's come back darker than Daz's hair. So he's excited about that. And we're just so glad to see you, Daryl. He took, was able to take both of his treatments on this past Friday. And you'll take, I think, two weeks until the next one. Is that right? So we want to pray for him. But I tell you what, let's just make, and I want us to go to meeting tonight. We've been in camp meeting Jubilee this week in the church about, oh, it's just the size of these two Owls maybe, but boy, I tell you, those folks went to meeting. I enjoyed preaching last night. Been getting several uh, uh, friends' requests from those folks and uh, responses about the preaching. And we've heard some good fellowship and preaching. 
Brother uh, David Bailey went with me, and we just got home at 5.30, a little bit after 5.30, and uh, we're both in the Lord's house tonight. And we've been in church all morning this morning, and it's just been a blessing. And uh, these folks, what I noticed about them, they got in the house of God, and they sang. Man, everybody got a book. They sang out. And I think we can do that. What are we doing tonight? We're going to have a choir, so we want everybody to get in the choir tonight that can and let's sing the praise of God. So let's just come around here and meet at the altar. And uh, you say, Preacher, I usually don't go to the altar. Let it be your first time. Come on. Let's meet around. Let's pray. Amen. Everybody will. Just come on that can. If you're not, if you're physically able, come and let's pray. Talk to God. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before the presence of the Lord and we thank you for the open door and the opportunity. We thank you for this wonderful privilege that you've given us to be in the house of God. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the choir tonight. Lord, help them to sing with, with the praise of the Lord and Lord, with the glory of God. I pray that you'd bless our service here tonight. Lord, we need the help of God. Lord, we know that you're able to move upon us and pull the heartstrings. And Lord, we pray that we'll just come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, have your way here. I pray the will of God to be done. Lord, we thank you for what our hearts have heard and felt this week, the stirring of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray tonight for Naomi Curtis. I pray for her. I pray for Brother Ray Cantrell and Mary that just had the heart calf today. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to continue to touch Brother Jeremiah Cooley and give him strength in his physical body. Lord, I pray for Brother Billy Mitchell today. God, that you'd stir him and help him, Lord, and touch his family as he's no doubt just on the verge of heading to glory. I pray for Miss Dolores tonight. Lord, that you'd bless her. God, give her strength and help in her life. And I know it's tiresome going to the hospital, but Lord, one of these days we're going to heaven. And I pray that you'd give us a little glory and joy to go to heaven on. Now, Lord, meet the need. Help us to preach with the power of God. Lord, stir our hearts and our souls today. And we'll be careful to glory in the name of Christ to give you the praise. For it's all in Jesus' name. Make your ways on up to the choir. Come on. Amen. Everybody will. Come on up here and let's fill up this choir. Come on. Amen. You know, we've got room for two more folks in the choir. <laughs> so we'd like to have two more. Do I have two volunteers? All right. Oh, page 286. Page 286. We'll be singing out of the Red Church Hymn tonight, page 286, The Glory Land Way.
page 368. The next song is page 368 at the bottom, Nothing But the Blood. Or you can be seated this time. I'll ask uh, Brother Kyle uh, if he'll come sing for us. I would like to say I appreciate all God's blessings. He's been so good to me and my family. I thank you for my grandchildren and got Justice with us tonight, Michael. Justice is going to sing with me tonight, so y'all pray for me. I don't read music, so she's going to help me out and see if we can do this, so y'all pray for us. I'm kind of home, sick for our country, to which I never been. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time won't matter anymore. Yeah. 
a clap after songs, but I want to give that lady a good hand of applause. That was a wonderful job. I'm telling you, when she stood back here, I thought, we'll never hear her. Brother Mike kind of pushed her up, and I thought, man, she could have done it from back there. That was good. I enjoyed that. And I'll tell you what I appreciate about what you, you did something for God, and you put your heart into that. And you know, that, that should teach all of us something. We ought to put our hearts in what we're doing. For the Lord. Brother Dave, we've heard some great preaching. And it's, we've heard some very humble preaching. And we've heard some hide-skinning preaching this week, haven't we? Amen. Some of them fellows today, I thought, boy, they saved the rough to the last. And, uh, but on Monday night, dear brother, I've met him several times. And uh, he's 78 years of age. His name is Brother uh, Chuck Kesey. And he got up and he said, Turn to Luke 15. And I wasn't expecting a whole lot, just to be honest with you. But he done a whole lot better than I hoped he would have done because I had to preach the next night. And he got up and he preached a message. And I'm getting a copy of this. They're sending it to me. They uh, thought they had it made for me today, but they couldn't locate it. But he preached a message on the elder son of the, of the two of the, of the prodigal son, his brother. And uh, what he used was this. He preached on an offended spirit. And I'm telling you, I was convicted in my heart as a preacher and a pastor and uh, how that we can get offended so easily at things. And you think when you're offended, it doesn't affect you. I'm telling you, it'll rob you spiritually. And he began to preach and he gave us four things on the offended spirit. And he talked about the characteristics. That, I'll not get into his message, but the characteristics and then he preached on the curse of the offended spirit. And then he preached on the cause of the offended spirit. And his was simple. The cause was simply, he said, I've been here all this time. My brothers left and I've been here. And you've not been good to me. Where have you not killed? Why have you not killed the fatted calf for me? And you know, we can do that very same thing. See somebody that's been out in the world a while. They come in, they get right with God. And the thing of it is, it don't mean the Father loves you any less because He's loving on Him. But He loves Him because He's a son. And then, the, the, then He preached not only the characteristics and the curse and the cause, but He preached on the cure. The cure. And when He got on that, He said the Lord left that story open. We don't know what the result was. We don't know what that elder brother done. He said the Lord entreated him to come in. Now we don't know if he ever got his heart right with God. We don't know if he ever just stayed bitter. We don't know. And he said so. He believes the Bible's just leaving that open. 
for you and I to be able to finish that story. I tell you, if Brother David didn't hear him preach that, I'd preach that tonight. But it was good. And uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms. I just, for some reason, God will not let me get away from the book of Psalms. I had plans and all plans to preach out of the book of Acts, chapter 27 and chapter 28, when the Bible talks about after they went shipwreck, and the Bible said they landed to the uh, little island called Melita. That's where we named our uh, sister. Mom and dad named her Stacy Melita. Mom liked that name of that island in the Bible. It actually was a, a wicked place and not a good place, but yet it was a beautiful name. And so she named her Melita. And the Bible said when they came to Melita that the barbarians showed them no little kindness. And I tell you, if the barbarians can be kind, then you and I as God's people ought to be able to show just a little bit of kind. Hey, would you help me a little bit? How many is alive tonight? Amen. Uh, now, how many is glad you're saved? Amen. I'm glad to be saved by the grace of God. Then I've got something else that I want to uh, maybe let some of our Sunday school classes be interested in. How many of you know Brother David Gibb? We went and heard David over at Mount Pisgah. How many of you have heard his testimony? of how that God's used him and why that God's used him. And and the pastor, Brother Prophet, was talking to me when we were eating lunch today, and he gave me the DVD. I'm going to watch it. Some of the Sunday school classes may want to see this. But he talked about uh, Brother David's mother had tuberculosis, and the church that she was attending way out in the country, and they told her, said, we don't want you to come back here. You've got tuberculosis, and we're scared to death of this and it could be so catchy, don't come back. You stay at home, she kept trying to go to church. Well, another preacher had come in the area, and he felt impressed to open up a church. He went by to visit Miss Gibbs, I think, if I'm not mistaken, her husband had died or he had left, or something to that effect. But they said that he had uh, come by, and he invited her to come to that church. So they started out with 10 people, and then it started growing a little bit, and then he put her over teaching Sunday school. And she was teaching Sunday school to little kids. And she got to loving these kids. And these kids had no way to come to the house of God. The tuberculosis had caused her to be so crippled. She couldn't even move hardly. And she had her son David and said, I want you to take me. And it was a a big place that had buses, had charter buses. And said, I want you to take me there. And said, why? Said, just take me there said, I've got to do something, and she had no money whatsoever. So she walked into that great big bus company and told the receptionist, she said, can I help you? She said, yes. She said, I'm here to get a bus. And she said, well, ma'am, I don't know what to do, and I'll just have to call the owner. Called the owner, and he came out there and seen her and talked to her, and he said, ma'am, I appreciate your ambition, but we can't just give you a bus. And said, yeah, you'll give me a bus. And said, God told me that you're going to give me two buses. And said before she left, she left with keys to two, not just school buses, but two charter buses. And he said, uh, she said, looked at him, and Sister Gibbs said, Now, uh, there's something else I need from you. And said, What do you need? First of all, the reason she needed the buses, she told him. She said, I'm teaching Sunday school. She crippled up. And when she got to the parking lot, she fell out of the vehicle, fell out of her wheelchair. Brother David got her up and said, Mama, let's just go home. She said, no, take me in there. And said, we need some buses. We got. What do you need buses for? She said, we're going to haul some kids to church that can't get to the house of God. And said she got them there. And said that church went from 10 to 3,000 people. And she said, well, she told me, but I need something else from you. I said, what do you need? I said, you give me the two buses, now I need two men to drive them. And said, before she walked out, that man had designated drivers for those buses. And I tell you, that's the kind of desire. If a woman, back in that many years ago, that has tuberculosis, that was crippled, that would still love Jesus and sinners enough, then what, why can't we fill this place up this coming Sunday? Will you help me do it? Let's do that. Let's be in our place. Let's come. Let's get in the house of God at Liberty Baptist Church and and let's win souls to Jesus 
and I want to maybe some of our classes to watch this DVD. How many of the teachers would be interested in that? Amen. That's wonderful. We'll do that. And let's just take turn. I got it in my car. Joan, if you want to be first, you get it from me tonight. Give it to Greg. Give it to Corey, whoever wants it, and we'll do that. Good to have Larry with us today. Went back and got to meet him. He, uh, I, I had no idea, but he said he was uh, Brother Kenneth's brother. And I looked at him and you know, I've not been pastoring for 32 years, uh, 34 years, counting both churches, not to learn something. And I said, well, brother, you got all the looks. He said, I like you already. And so I appreciate that, Larry. Good to meet you, sir. Glad to have you at Liberty Baptist Church. And uh, then we want to pray for Miss Naomi Curtis. Naomi is very sick. She's in the intensive care. She, uh, her potassium levels were so dangerous. Uh, actually, at a life-threatening danger, she didn't know my aunt Anita today. By the way, my aunt, who just had cataract surgery, but had such a desire to go and had Sister Ruth to drive her up to the hospital to visit with Naomi today. Naomi didn't actually know much of who she was. And then Brenda went up, Sandra went up, and uh, uh, I think Sandra probably got to see her, I'm not sure. But when Brenda was there, they had already taken her for dialysis. And Naomi Curtis needs the help of God. So I want you to pray for her. Sister Mary Cantrell had a heart calf today, had no problems, but she probably just now getting home. Pray for Mary that God would touch her life. Others that need the help of God, the barn meetings this week. And if I just keep going on and on, I'm not going to get this message. So standing together with me in the book of Psalms, chapter number 61. And I want to preach tonight about the heart. I don't want to talk about the merry heart. I don't want to preach on the saddened heart. But I want to preach on the overwhelmed heart. Sometimes the heart gets overwhelmed. You say, preacher, what's it mean to be overwhelmed? I'll share that in just a few seconds, reading the entire eight verses of Psalm 61. The Bible said, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Notice that last word, the word I, that capital letter I. My friend, when your heart's overwhelmed, uh, better than going to the doctor or better than going to the psychologist, you better get to God. Amen. He said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the cover of thy wings, Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows, and uh, thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God uh, forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto the name forever, unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform thy vows. Would you be seated tonight asking God's favor? Lord, we thank you for the word of God. I pray that you'd anoint my heart, my spirit, my life. Lord, I thank you for the energy uh, to preach the scriptures tonight. I pray that you'd help us all. So good to see Daryl in the service, and we give you glory for that. We pray that you'll touch Naomi in a special way, and we'll pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I, I want us to notice before I start in the first verses, I want to start in the latter verses of these eight verses of Psalm 61. The psalmist David is uh, praying or speaking to us here, and he's talking to the chief musician, which is not strange. The whole Psalms is actually a composition of songs that are compiled together. And uh, a lot of times the Psalms uh, are not read, but they are actually sung. Some of you remember Lester Roloff. And Lester Roloff told his uh, boys and girls, especially in the girls' home, that they would sing through the book of Psalms. They wouldn't read it. They would actually sing it. And it's a precious thing to sing those old songs like that. The old gentleman that was 78 years old, the pastor said, I want him to come back and sing. And he got up and sang a song that I'd never heard. The melody wasn't pretty. 
There was no tune to it. It had no rhyme. It seemed to have no reason. But I tell you what it had. It had God in the midst of the song. And it was the old country type of singing like they did up back when your great great grandfathers were out in the fields plowing and God began to get in their soul and they began to get overwhelmed with God and he began to sing it and have a few words that sound like a song and then he would talk it out and uh, by the time it was over with everybody was just praising God so that tells me tonight that you don't have to have a bunch of music and you don't have to have a bunch of hip or hop in order to have God, but you've got to have some content in what you're singing about, and that's what I like the choir did tonight. But here in the last verses, he said he shall abide before God forever, and he said, oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. And he said, so will I sing praise unto thy name forever that I may daily perform thy vows. Now what I want to preach tonight is this. I'm talking about the overwhelmed heart. Uh, but why can we not perform uh, our vows before God? Uh, what's keeping us from having a song before God? And I'm going to tell you something. Whether you enjoy this or not, I'm going to so you might as well just get happy with me and uh, enjoy the preaching and amen a little bit. And the faster that you amen, the faster I'll preach and the faster we'll get done. But I want you to know tonight that we have a vow that we owe before God. Uh, we have a song that ought to be sung before God. Not just a song when you're on the mountaintop, but we ought to have a song when we're down in the valleys of life. You'll never be able to sing in the valley if you can't sing on the mountain and don't ever expect to sing the songs of victory on the mountaintop if you never sing the song of God's grace in the time of the valley. One preacher said this today. He said you'll never be able to preach a message about grace until you've experienced or it needed grace in your own life. Boy that hit home to me and how true that is Nobody can ever share the grace of God until you first come to the place where you've needed grace in your own life. I believe that's true. Now let's look at this together. I want you to see that he talks to us here in verse, uh, uh, verse number one and verse number two. He said, hear my prayer, uh, my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. It seemed like that David had many times cried out to God like this. You remember in Psalms 40 when he said, I uh, waited patiently on the Lord. I cried in the Lord. And then he said this. He said, when I cried, he inclined his ear and he heard me. Did you know there's times that people can uh, call out and nobody hears yet? Uh, but there's a difference when you begin to cry out to God. I tell you there, uh, there comes a place in your life and my life uh, where we need to quit talking and we ought to start weeping and crying out to God. Uh, the scripture said uh, in verse number one, uh, as uh, David was crying here, he said hear my cry, O God God and attend unto my prayer. He said from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Now let's take just a second tonight and look at this word overwhelmed. What does it mean? What does it refer to? How does it affect your life? How does it affect my life today? Uh, the word overwhelmed uh, simply means that you become, uh, uh, you become submerged uh, underneath. You know what? The cares of this life can put you to a place uh, where you feel like that you're underneath everything and you're just about to drown. Uh, have you been watching uh, some of our uh, political things the last uh, couple of weeks? I'm going to tell you, uh, friend, uh, I don't care what party you're with, uh, we Republicans and uh, we Democrats, uh, we're in a lot of trouble. You know why? Because uh, our hearts uh, have been overwhelmed. You say, preacher, why? It's not because they don't want one man to have a particular job, uh, but the world has taken its hold upon uh, the society uh, with this thing called abortion. And that's what it's all about. Uh, they don't want abortion ever uh, to be overturned. And I tell you, my heart has 
just been overwhelmed uh, years ago uh, when this country has voted in a portion in this land. Uh, we care about the snail darter. We care about the whale. We care about all these things, but yet we don't seem to have any uh, concern uh, over a human life uh, than we do anything else. We spend millions and millions of dollars upon uh, protecting the snail darter and that uh, the dam never got built uh, because of the snail darter. But you know what embarrassed the scientists? That years later came to pass and they found out that there's a multitude of snail darters throughout of the land. There was a whale in California in Sacramento and that whale had got out of the ocean and from the salt water and he made his way uh, inland uh, to the fresh water and uh, they said uh, for a couple days the scientists and all the people were watching around Sacramento, California. Uh, people were coming in there. Uh, they were bringing in pipelines and they were taking sounds of other whales underneath the water and they were trying to draw that whale uh, back out and here's what they said happened. All these scientists and this has been way years ago. They spent $60,000 and uh, you know what? Everybody was spectating and they were going to see what our nation was going to do about this whale who was about to lose its life. But at the same time uh, the whale could have died. Uh, there were thousands of babies that were being aborted every day in the United States of America. There were no spectators. There were no protesters. There were no one that cared for them. Uh, but everybody was around. Uh, their hearts were overwhelmed. Uh, they went under the water but that old whale was submerged underneath. That whale was overwhelmed and they said the fresh water is going to kill that whale. Uh, they done everything they could. They tried to push it. Uh, they tried to hoist that whale uh, but no uh, no accomplishment was made. They said all of a sudden that whale on his own he began to flip his tail. He turned up and he pushed his fins and on his own after all the spectators and the $60,000 uh, had been spent that whale on his own free will he sails back out into the salt water never to be seen again. He was just fine. All the spectators scratched their head and they walked off. I tell you tonight there's something the church ought to be overwhelmed about. We ought not be so concerned. Hey you say preacher you care about the snail order? Yes oh yeah I care about the snail order. I care about the whale. I care about all that stuff. I think we ought to do what we can. I lived in a day when I grew up when I was a kid. You know how people used to hold their trash off? They took it down to the branch. You ever heard what a branch is? We call it a creek today. And they threw their trash in the branch and they waited on the big rain to cut to wash it down to the neighbor's place. Amen. I don't think that's right. I think that's dirty. It's nasty. I'm glad that we've got a little better in our environment and we've got better with that. But I tell you, we got overwhelmed with the things and the cares of this world. But there's one thing that we need to understand. The church has failed to get overwhelmed about the failure and the failure praise unto an almighty God and the failure that we have that we are not keeping our vows before God. You know what there is? It may not be the spectators around Sacramento, California, but you know we got spectators all around here tonight. Did you know there's people that come here on Sunday to realize, to see who's here and who's not here? You say, preacher, they're here for the wrong reason. That's all right. I don't care what reason they came for. If they get in here, uh, then God touches their heart. As long as you're doing the right thing and I'm doing the right thing, they may not become a spectator they may become a participator in the service of God. Don't you think we need that tonight? The people's looking to see, are you in your seat? Are you where you're supposed to be? Are you praising God? Are you, why aren't you in the choir when you used to sing in the choir? How come you're not going to Sunday school when you used to go to Sunday school? How come you're not saying amen when you used to say amen? The world is standing around us like spectators and they're going to see if we're going to do something on our own free will for God or is God going to have to kill us the way we are? 
I want to say tonight that David said, I, Lord, I want you to hear my cry. I want you to understand it. I want you to hear my prayer and attend to it. He said, from the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. My son, he said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. But I want to tell you tonight that sometimes we get overpowered. And that's another definition for the word overwhelmed. It's to be submerged under. It's to be overpowered. It means to be crushed. It means to be drowning. And what did David do when his heart was overwhelmed? I've got to tell you this story today. Brother David and I heard this. And I like this. Amen. The preacher that talked about his grandpa that had the old mule or his daddy that had the old mule. And he said that, he said that every morning, he said, my dad would go down uh, to the crib or the barn. He said, uh, and uh, the mule would see him coming and the mule would come and he said he wouldn't go in the barn he wouldn't go to the stall he said dad would go in there put out his grain or his straw and he said that mule would stand there until dad went in he said dad would get down in the middle of that stall now this has been years and years ago this fellow was up in his years that told it and he was old enough to be my grandfather and he had told about his daddy and he said uh, he said he would pray he said to God done praying he'd say God, help my wife, help my children. He said, help uh, just everything to think and think of. God, would you uh, help them and thank you for this and thank you for that. He said he was so overwhelmed with the praise of God. He said, and that mule got used to daddy going in there and he never would come out. He said, go in till daddy come out. He said, daddy come out of the barn and he said, as soon as he got done praying and he said, in Jesus name, amen. He said, that mule would go in. He said, one day dad was coming by. He said he was busy. He said he was so overwhelmed with everything that was going on that he didn't have time uh, to go pray, but he had to feed his mule. He said the old mule come uh, to the edge of the door and he said uh, he slapped him, you know, on the side. And he went and dumped his grain uh, and he said he come back out and the mule just stood there and he said uh, uh, go on mule, go ahead and eat. He said that old mule wouldn't budge. He said he was Daddy was pushing on that mule. He said, if you ever seen a man try to push an 800 pound mule, he said he wouldn't go. He said that mule stood there and he said he understood that something wasn't right. He said, Dad uh, said, hey, I'm in a hurry. You've got to get in there. You've got to eat your grain and go on. And he said that mule wouldn't budge. He said all those years that mule stood there while he went in to pray. He said he was so overwhelmed that he couldn't couldn't pray that day. And he said before he left, he said he finally had to stand there, laid his hands on that old mule and said, dear God, I want to thank you for everything. I thank you for this. I want to thank you for that. And he said about the time he said, in Jesus name, amen, the mule walked in the stall and he got him something to eat. He said, you know what? He said, when gets so overwhelmed that we don't think there's a power or there's an importance in prayer. He said, but there's one thing that that mule knew about my dad. He didn't know whether dad would feed him one day to the next day. He said, but there's one thing that he knew. He said, that mule knew that my dad believed in the power of prayer. Amen. I tell you today, if the animals can be a spectator and they can understand that our hearts are overwhelmed with us, that we get crushed, then what is the world thinking about us tonight? I want you to see these quick, these things quickly. And I promise you, not I'll be done before you think I'll even start. But I want you to see this. What did David do when his heart was overwhelmed? God's just been feeding my soul through the book of Psalms. And I don't know why he wanted me to go to Psalm 61 tonight. And all the way home, I was thinking that I'd be preaching out of Acts. But we look here and we see that the first thing that David done is he reached for God. My friend, when your heart's overwhelmed within you, you better start reaching out to God. You say, preacher, why? Listen, your politicians are not going to help you. They're not. Your, your, your hope 
is not going to be helped in those. Your hope's not going to be uh, helped uh, with the things of society that's around you. But I'm going to tell you something. When everything else fails us and everyone else fails us, we better uh, find out that we better cry out to God for the help we need in our life. He began to reach out for God. What did he do? Verses 1 and 2, he said, Hear me, Lord. Verses number 2 and verse number 3, he said, Lord, would you help me? And then in verse number 2, in the latter part, notice this. He said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. He was saying, Lord, he said, I want to get near the rock. Why? Because the rock's bigger than we are. And he said, I need some help. I want to find some help. And Lord, uh, would you hide me in that rock? He reached for God. But what's the second thing that he did tonight in verse number 3, of which I just read, uh, verse 2 that I read, but verse 3, he said, For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. You know what he done? He begins to recall God from the blessings of the past. Hey, have you ever come to the place where the only thing you could do, you say, hey, God's not blessing me. God's not answering my prayer. I want you to be honest with me. Have you ever felt like God doesn't answer your prayer? How many believes that? How many's ever felt that? How many has ever felt like you've been in a place right now or somewhere in your life that God not only didn't hear you, but God just wasn't helping you with anything? You ever been there? I'm going to be honest with you. I've been there. A lot, a lot more recent than what many of you think. I wondered tonight when I first started preaching, and I looked out and I thought, I've seen people who were happy at a funeral. And I said, God, you're going to help us? We've got some. Now, I know. I've been in meeting all this week. Got to preach last night. Oh, what a blessing it was. And I enjoyed being in the service. But hey, that wasn't my people. This is my people. This is where my heart was. I could have stayed tonight. And I told the pastor, I want to come back and get with our folks. I think God's stirring us. God's going to give us revival at Liberty Baptist Church and I need to be back. He said, that's fine. We understand that. But I'll tell you what he began to do here. He began to recall the blessings of God. And if you can't give God praise for something that you don't feel like you're getting today or you're not getting help from God today or you're not getting heard from God or you're not getting hit from God, then why don't you remind God that in the past he's been your shelter. Has there ever been a time in your life that God's been the shelter for you? Did you notice what he said in verse number three? He said, for thou hast been. He didn't say you are today. He said, but Lord, you've been a a shelter for me and you've been a strong tower from the enemy. So that's what he did. He not only reached out for God, but yet he starts recalling the blessings of God. You know, If you just say, I wish that I had something to praise God for. And Brother Brother Darrell, I'm going to use you tonight as an illustration. Please, don't don't think I'm being critical. Last Sunday, a week ago, you were about the lowest point since you've been dealing with this cancer. I mean, you felt like God just wasn't doing anything. I mean, you're sick. You couldn't go to church. You couldn't do anything. Sunday night, you had to be taken to the emergency room. They ran scans. From what I've read and understand, they ran scans on your life, on your body. And they said, hey, you know, we'll give him some medicine, do this, but we can't find anything more than than just what he's going through. And they sent you home. Is that right? Sent you home. You went home helpless, didn't you, brother? I mean, you felt like all hope was gone. But you know what happened? I paid God, began to touch him. And God began to do some things and he still was going through some rough times and uh, he was so sick and he had some things going on. He goes back to the doctor Friday. I went over Wednesday to see him on Wednesday night. One week from today, he was sitting there in the chair. We were able to laugh. He was weak. He was sick. His daughter was there. Son-in-law was there. And uh, uh, grandchildren was there. And uh, uh, there wasn't a whole lot. He said, I'm going to go back Friday. And he said, I wish I could take this treatment. His daughter said, now dad, you're probably not going to get to take the treatment Friday. You're going to have to let your body get some strength in it. Daryl was so discouraged because he wants to get over these. They're telling Daryl, you're cancer free. But, cancer free, but you've got to take these treatments. 
And uh, there are six treatments which consist of actually 12. Each treatment has two parts. So he goes for the treatments, takes one part, takes another part, and then most of the time he has to take a shot that just wipes him out. And you say, well, he's got every reason not to rejoice or to be happy in God. Now, I'm not being ugly about this. You and I are friends, right? But I'll tell you something, Daryl. I've seen the day that God's answered your prayer. I know the times that God's touched you. And I tell you, if we can't praise God for what we're feeling today, then let's refresh our memory and say, God, I do remember what you did for me three years ago. I remember what you did for me last week. I remember that. Hey, and Daryl's sitting here in the house of God. You say, you pick it on him. I'm not picking on him. He's here tonight. That lets me know that somehow, somewhere, he's refreshed his memory with God about, Lord, you've been good to me. You know why there's a lot of pews that's empty tonight? Because a lot of people said, God's not doing nothing for me today. But they don't remember what God did yesterday. They don't remember that. Brother Joseph, they think God's not hiding me in the, in the rock today. I'm not hid in the shelter, so I'll just not go. There's no reason that I need to sing. I don't need to keep any vows before God. Why should I do this? Well, I'm going to tell you what you ought to do. Why don't you think back? Well, like myself, I'll be 56 years old a week from this coming Monday, and I was saved at the age of 17. If I went from 17 to 56, and God God never done anything in between. You know what I should do? I should refresh my memory when I was 17. So what did God do for you at 17? He saved me from hell. You say, so what? Stick your hand on the stove eye and see how much you appreciate heaven. Get close to the stove and don't even touch it, but get close enough to the heat and you'll feel what it's like. Go through a time of your life when you can't hear anything, can't see anything because of the darkness, and you realize that you're all by yourself, and you know how sad it is to be lonely, and then you begin to think about this, that he's a friend that's closer than a brother, and you start reminding God of the times when nobody else would fellowship with you but God. You start doing that, you know what happens? You start refreshing your memory. You say, well, that's not what he's doing. He's refreshing God's memory. Hey, folks, God don't have a memory. God don't have to remember anything. He's God. He knows the first from the last, the last to the first. What he was doing, he was reminding God. But what he didn't really understand, God didn't have to be reminded. He was just reminding God so he could remember. Has that ever happened in your life? God just says, well, tell me what I've done in the past. He's not doing that for His sake. God already knows. He's doing that for you. So you'll remember what God's done in the past in your life. Now let me hurry with this. I want you to notice. The Bible tells us this. In verse number 4, He said, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. And then he says, Selah. So there's a separation now or a pause between verse number four and verse number five. The word Selah simply is telling you to pause and think, meditate about this. So what we're doing is we're seeing that, that David, when his heart's overwhelmed, he not only reaches for God and he not only recalls the blessings from God, but he begins to resolve some things about God. Verse number four, he said, I'll abide in thy tabernacle. You know what? The word abide, it means to go to the house to be a guest overnight. You know the biggest problem, I don't mean to be critical here, but it's just you and I here tonight, God. We come to church on Sunday morning and we have no intentions on abiding with God. Our intentions is to stay to 12 o'clock. And even if some of us stay past 12, we've already went home. Amen. Amen. We didn't come to abide. You had family to come in, they drive five hours to visit you. They stay 10 minutes, drive five hours back. 
They had no intentions of abiding with you. They just come to commute. What they did is they come, they come so you would know that you cared so much about them that you'd drive five miles, five hours to spend ten minutes. Folks, listen. We've got to realize that God done a lot more than that. The Lord came 2,000 years ago and He didn't come to commute and leave. But He said, I must abide at your house today. He began to Resolve some things about God. He said, Lord, I didn't come to get out. I come to get in. And then he said, Lord, you've been a cover. Notice what he said in verse number four. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. You know what a covert is? That covert is a secret place. He said, I've come to get along with God. He he decided to find God's uh, secret place. And he said, when I get in that secret place, I'm going to stay with him. I had a cousin one time. If you're worried, let me just kind of free your mind of something. No business meeting tonight. Can I have about four more minutes to finish this up? We'll have business meeting. You say, preacher, I want to know what that report says. I can tell you, we had the biggest intake of our church for the month of September. We took in $68,196 and we only spent out $32,000. That's a pretty good report. Session closed. Amen. Do I hear? I don't want to say, do I hear a move to adjourn? I'm afraid you'll leave. But I want you to see tonight that what he's saying is this. He just said, Lord, when I find the secret place with God, I'm going to stay there for a while. Why don't we decide to stay where God's put us? Stay and abide with Him. Now, believe this or not, three more little things. Look in verse 5. He said, For thou, O God, hast heard my vows, Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. In verse number 5, whether you gather this from that verse or not, but he said, God, you hast heard my vows. He wasn't saying vows as in just promises, but he's talking about his rejoicing. Did you know that God's heard us in our time of rejoicing? You don't make a vow to God when things are bad. You make a vow to God when things are good. When everything good, say, God, I'm just going to do this forever. I'm going to live with you forever. Boy, the Lord's blessing it. I'm just going to do this. I tell you what, he begins to, he begins to rejoice in God. He talks about in verse number five, the heritage. And not only does he talk about the heritage of those that fear thy name, he's talking about the heritage, which means the possession. Many of you have heard Brother Joseph testify. There's one thing that you'll remember, that when Brother Joseph has testified in the past, that he'll say this, I want to thank God for my... What is it, Joseph? What is it? What is a heritage? I want to tell you something. A heritage is not just because his mama was a praying mama and his daddy believed in God. Heritage simply means, Lord, I want to thank you for my possessions. What we have today because of what was instilled in your hard life. You grew up on fried okra and you still love it today. Beans and potatoes. You know what David and I had for lunch at a church dinner today? We had pinto beans and homemade fried cornbread. I didn't eat the cornbread. David did. They had homemade sauerkraut and wieners. I ate some wieners at UT Hospital the other day. That would have put you in the hospital. (laughs) They were that bad. But these were so good. I knew I wasn't supposed to have them because of my hearing, the brine, the salt that's in them. But it was so good. My stomach possessed them. My heart possessed them. My tongue possessed the taste. And I went back and got more. And I'm going to ask the pastor tonight after the service, hey, did you buy them in a can? Did somebody make them? Tell me where you got them from. And if you do have some leftovers, mail them to me. Somebody's handed that down as a heritage, I guess. 
But we ate that. A lot of the kids today, my grandkids wouldn't want sauerkraut and wieners. They'd rather have pizza. I like pizza pretty good too. But I'd rather have those sauerkraut and wieners. Good. But what we have today is God has given us a heritage. That don't mean we have to think back what God used to be. But that means it tells us we possess something today because of that heritage. Amen. Now, I'm coming to the last two things. When we see the rejoicing of the Lord, He talks about the heritage, and then He talks about His part of a lifelong lineage of God's people. Now, there's a few of you here tonight who didn't have parents that knew the Lord. You didn't have grandparents that knew the Lord. But even if you did not, God let you grow up in a country, and He let you grow up in communities that knew something about God, even if your parents didn't go to church. I had parents that went to the house of God. My mom's dad was a preacher. He died when I was six years of age. My dad's mother was a godly woman, and she shouted everywhere she went, and it embarrassed me at times, but I tell you, if she was here today, I wouldn't be embarrassed not one bit for her to shout all over this place. Would you care? I appreciate that heritage. But their shouting and my grandpa being a preacher isn't what saved me. But I'm glad God's given me a greater heritage. He's given me His Son who I never knew, but yet He knew me. And He allowed me to become a friend once I became a sinner. Once I became a sinner, I became a son, I became a friend. I became a child of God. What a possession we have. Verse 6 and verse 7, this is quick. The Bible said, That will prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. Verse 7, he said, He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. You know what he's doing? He said, Lord, if my heart's overwhelmed with me, I'm going to reach for you. I'm going to recall some things of my life. I'm going to resolve some things about God. I'm going to rejoice in God. But he said, I'm just going to rest in God. We've had a long week. We've been in church morning. and We've been in church at night. Soon as we ate dinner, and I had that second bowl of plate of sauerkraut and weenies, I was fixing to leave and I looked over. David was going for cherry pie, homemade. He ate that. I envied him as he ate it. He ate that. He got us a cup of water and we walked out. We drove straight home, unpacked our things, got in the car, came back to church, said, Preacher, are you tired? I'm ready to rest, but I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if you're getting anything out of this message tonight or not, but I'm resting more right now in the presence of God that I will be when I go home tonight. We need to rest in God. You know why? God gave him a prolonged life. God gave him a preserved life. But the last thing is they come quickly to the music. He begins to respond to the kindness of God. He said, Lord, you've been so good to me. He said, so here's what's going to happen. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever that I may daily Perform thy vows. Some of us feel like the only time that we're supposed to ever serve God is on Sunday. You never serve God on Sunday. You worship God on Sunday. You serve Him through the week. And he said, Lord, you've blessed me so good that I'm making my vows. He's rested on God. I wonder tonight, while we all stand across the auditorium, not even going to ask it about your head or close your eyes.